Well, good morning. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here today. And whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online, we're going to join in together as one church to lift up and worship our God. Amen. So come on, let's worship together.
can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power.
want to be in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus, that, Lord, we realize today that there's nothing that is impossible with you, that you're the God who's a very present help in times of trouble and difficulty in our lives, that you're very present in this moment this morning. Lord, we thank you that you are here to work in every heart and every life. We thank you that we can bring every burden, every concern, every need in our life to you today with confident assurance. You're the God that supplies every need according to your riches and glory. So, Lord, I pray this morning as we've gathered in this place, as we're worshiping you, that you would lift every burden from our heart, that you would remind us that you are already at work in our lives, that good things are already happening, that you're for us, you're not against us, Lord, that you're breaking through strongholds, Lord, you're delivering us from evil forces, you're setting us free from things that have held us captive. You're healing hearts today, you're healing bodies today, you're healing minds in this place today. Lord, you're doing your work. Your kingdom is in this place today, ruling and reigning. So we invite you to work in every heart and every life. We pray that, Lord, whatever we might be concerned about, we release it to you even now. That our confidence and our trust in you, because you are the trustworthy God. For that we thank you in Jesus' name. And all the church together said, Amen. Amen. You glad to be in church this morning? Good to see you. Welcome to God's house today. So glad that you're here. You're looking good on this chilly November morning. Why don't you take a moment, swing around, wave at some people around you, let them know you're glad to see them in church today. You can be seated. Welcome again. So glad to see all of you here this morning at this time of worship. If you are with us today for the very first time, we're especially glad that you are with us this morning. I'm going to ask all of our regulars to give a good round of applause to those with us for the first time. We do that. Welcome, glad you're here. If this is your first time, grab this uh, worship guide you received on the way in. If you'll notice to the far right-hand section, uh, this says new here. It's a QR code right there. Grab your phone, scan that QR code, and then hit send so we have the opportunity of getting to know you and make you connected to or get you connected to some of our resources here at our church. We'd love to be a blessing in your life. A lot of good things happening in church life. Encourage you to always check it out regularly at church-redeemer.org slash info. That's church-redeemer.org slash info. Uh, All the updated information is always there for you. Just a couple things that I do want to draw to your attention today. Don't forget this coming Wednesday evening is our Thanksgiving Eve service. It happens right here at 7 p.m. Also on our Frederick campus at 7 p.m. as well. You don't want to miss that time. I know that all of us have lots to give thanks for this year. We want to come together as God's people on Wednesday evening again, 7 p.m. for that wonderful, wonderful time of celebration. Also, this past uh, Saturday, actually yesterday, we had the opportunity to engage in our outreach. We've been planning and preparing for that uh, for a number of weeks now. Many of you have been giving as a part of that, and you, many of you came out and served. So I wanted to give you just a quick update on what you guys did to make a difference in our communities. We served here in Gaithersburg. We actually had, uh, we served down in Wheaton and Silver Spring area and also uh, in the Frederick County area at our Frederick campus as well. And we served 9,087 people yesterday. Isn't that amazing? 9,087 people received food for their tummies in the name of Jesus yesterday because of the fact that you were communicating that love to them through your giving. We also had 314 of you that volunteered. Thank you to all of us. Come on, give them a good round of applause that volunteered. You made the difference out there and serving out in that cold weather, but you were with a smile on your face, making a difference, showing God's love. Uh, This year, we had prayer tents available for anyone that wanted to veer off of just the food line and head to a prayer tent to receive some prayer. And we had 1,291 people actually ask for prayer this week. Isn't that incredible? Out of that 9,000, over 9,000, we had uh, almost 1,300 of them that stopped and said, we want someone to pray for us. And in addition to that, we had 19 people who gave their hearts and lives to Jesus for the very first time. And all of that happened because of your generous giving and all of that happened because of your serving. We're so grateful that you've been a part of that. Christmas is coming up. We have another big outreach for our Christmas time. So watch out for that. Plan to be a part of it. Plan to serve in that area as well as we plan for the Christmas season coming up in just a few short weeks. Would you join me as we pray again together? Father, we thank you again for your word this morning. We ask that as we take this time to study your word, that you might speak to us. We pray that your word would come alive in every heart and every life today. For that, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Would you join me in welcoming our Frederick campus? Good morning to all the folks in Frederick. Let's give them a good round of applause this morning. Good to see all of us together today in worship. We're continuing our series entitled, How's Your Love Life? And I want to talk today about a definition, a clear understanding of what God's love really is. I told uh, the Saturday night service and the 9 o'clock service this morning, and I will repeat it again both in this service and the 1 o'clock service. Today's message that I will share with you, I believe certainly is the most important message in the entire series that I'm doing on the love, the love of God, how we express love, how we experience love. This is, I would say, the hallmark message of all the messages I will share, and perhaps the single most important message that I will share this entire year. Because this topic about God's love and understanding what His love is all about really can change us to the core of our being if we'll allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And so my prayer for you as well as for my own self today is that something fresh and something new will come to our hearts as we begin to understand at a new level, a deeper level, what the love of God is all about and how we are to express that to people around us. Every one of us have a deep need in our life, a need for love. You and I need to be loved. But love is incomplete if it's just kept yourself. Love is fulfilled when it's shared. God designed his love not only for you to experience in your life, but that his love might flow through you to other people. And we here in our Western culture have a bit of a challenge understanding love fully because we have different definitions of the same word. We use one word in English for the word love, and we use that to describe our love for our spouse, our love for our children, our love for a variety of things, even our love for uh, things like food that we have. I love my pizza. I love my spaghetti. I love my wife, and all the same word. But when you go into the Greek language, you begin to realize they were quite concerned about helping people to understand the differentiations, the different aspects of love. And there are four primary words of the Greek language. And by the way, the original New Testament was written in the Greek, tran- uh, Greek manuscript. And so the Greek language was and is the language of the New Testament. And there are four basic words that are used in Greek culture for love. The first one is the word storge. And the word storge means family love. It's a love that you have uh, for your children and ch- children for their parents. It is a love that is shared between siblings. It's something that is called familial love, storge love. And then we have a kind of love that's referred to as the eros love. We get our word erotic from that word. It's, an, it's a Greek word, eros, meaning romantic or sexual attraction. And most of us are familiar with that term. And then there's another word in the Greek language for love. It's called philia. And we're familiar with that word because there's a city not too far from the north of us called Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And so that is the root word philia. It means a brotherly affection. It is the friendship kind of relationship that we have with people. But there's one unique word in the Greek language that is designated for God and designated for the love that God has for us and the love that we are to have for one another. It is uniquely assigned in Scripture to the love of God, and that is this word. It is agape. Would you say that word with me? Agape. So when the Bible refers to God's love and refers to us loving one another, it's not just a storge kind of love, family love. That's a wonderful thing. Everybody should have that certainly is not the erotic kind of love that our culture knows so much about. It's not even just the philia love, the affectionate, friendly kind of love, but it goes much deeper than that. It is an agape love, and this word is the, represents the highest form of love that can be expressed. It is a selfless love. It is a love that is always concerned for the good of someone else. No self-interest at all, and no conditions based upon it. So the agape love of God is the most important love that you and I can experience, can understand, and can express to others. John, the great apostle, who's often known as the apostle of love, he wrote the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. He gave us those wonderful words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In his first epistle in 1 John, he helps us to understand something about this agape love. He says, dear friends, let us love, let us agape have the highest form of love for one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love love does not know God because God is. What is God? God is 
God is agape. He is the, he, the essence of his nature is the essence of love. It is who, in fact, he is, continuing on in the same chapter. And so we know and rely on the agape, on the love God has for us. God is love, agape. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Continuing in the same chapter, he says, there is no fear in agape, no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. All throughout the New Testament especially, but you also find roots of it in the Old Testament as well, we are called to experience God's love toward us, but also we are actually commanded to love one another. Loving is something that we're commanded to do. It is not a suggestion. It is not a nice idea. And in fact, the scripture teaches us that a lack of love, a lack of agape in our lives as believers, especially, is a, is, is a very serious sin. And actually, the lack of love is the mother of many other sins. There are a lot of other sins that will happen in your life if you don't have love in your life. And so what I want to do today, what I feel is so important for us to do together today is to try to understand at a higher level, a deeper level, what this love is all about. What is this love of God? If we're commanded to love, to experience it, and to share it, what is it? Two things today that we must understand about this agape love. Number one, this agape love is first and foremost a way of thinking. Love is not a feeling. In fact, agape love is never defined in Scripture as something that you feel. You may very well, well feel it at some point in time, but it is not driven by emotions. In fact, according to Scripture, love is a commitment first and foremost to think a certain way about a person. God's love begins with how you think about someone. What you think about a person will always determine your level of love toward them. An example of this would be in a marriage. How a husband thinks about his wife will determine the kind of love that husband, husband will have toward his wife. And how a wife thinks about her husband will determine the kind of love that will be expressed from her to her husband. And so how you think about people is very, very important when it comes to love. You cannot separate love from thought. Thinking and love always go together. In fact, even loving God requires the right kinds of thoughts about God. When Jesus was asked the question, what is the most important commandment of all? He answered it with these words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and with all your strength. There are four elements of this that we could talk about. Today, I'm only focusing upon the fact that we're told to love God with our thoughts, with our mind. That is, we need to think the right way about God, because if you do not think the right way about God, you will not be able to effectively love God. You will never love God well if your thoughts about Him are tainted, if your thoughts about God are poisoned, if your thoughts about God are misinformed or twisted. Your thoughts about God must be right if your love for Him is to be strong. There are lots of people who have wrong ideas about who God is. They see him as some distant being out there in the universe that is maybe angry with them and trying to somehow make their life miserable. And as long as you think of God that way, you will never have a love in your heart for God. So our thoughts about God will determine our love for God. And the same is true in every relationship in your life. Your thoughts about other people have to be right for your love for other people to be strong. If your thoughts about other people are tainted, if your thoughts about other people are poisoned, if your thoughts about other people are misinformed or twisted, love is never going to flow from you or never flow well from you and never flow fully toward the people around you. One of the most common things that Satan will try to do in relationships is he tries to get in your thinking about other people. If he can infiltrate how you think about someone, he can destroy your love for them. And in fact, that's exactly what Satan wants to do. Satan loves to create division. Satan loves to create strife. Satan loves to create walls between people. That's his, that's his agenda. That's what he wants to do. 
He's antithetical to God. He's opposed to God. And so if God is love, Satan is hatred. If God is unity, Satan is division. And so he wants to create all of these kind of issues between people so we don't come together, certainly among the people of God. And one of the ways he does that is by attacking your thinking. If he can get in your mind, he can win the battle in your life when it comes to love. If he can change the way you think about someone in a negative way, he's captured captured you. He's, he's drained from you the love that you need to express. And I've discovered over the years, and I will tell you I've discovered this and continue to discover it in my own life. I discover it from the people that I've worked with for well over 40 years of ministry. There are four main ways that Satan will attack your mind to try to drive out love from your life. Let's take a look at these. First of all, he does it through offenses. An offense is holding on to a hurt that you have in your life feeling justified about some kind of anger based upon mistreatment or perceived mistreatment. And so you get wounded on the inside and you hold on to that hurt. You hold on to that pain. You're not willing to let it go. It becomes a grudge. Oftentimes results in retaliatory behavior. It actually affects every part of your being because you view the other person through the lens of being offended at them. So your perspective of them is totally changed because you view them now as an enemy. You view them now in a way that is destructive to your life. And so you become very protective in the way that you live your life in regards to them. So you carry an offense. The second way that the enemy loves to attack us is through suspicions. A suspicion would be a negative imagination that you have about another person's motives or their heart or their intentions. And the enemy is very good at painting in our minds all these suspicions about other people, wondering what they really think about us and wondering what their motives are in our direction. What are their intentions? What is their heart toward us? And making us guess about that and to imagine that they're somehow opposed to us in some way or trying to hurt us in some way. These are suspicious kinds of thoughts and imaginations that will drive a wedge in your relationships. So he uses offenses. He uses suspicions. He also uses prejudices. A prejudice is an unrecognized or an unacknowledged, usually unacknowledged, sometimes it's unrecognized, most of the time it's unacknowledged, negative bias towards some, someone or negative bias toward a group of people. That when you form in your mind a negative bias towards someone, it affects how you view them. It's called a prejudgment, a prejudice that you carry. You may be aware of it. You may not be aware of it. Even if you're aware of it, you may not be willing to acknowledge that it exists in your life. And prejudice oftentimes goes through our being and in our relationships without us even realizing that it's there. It's very destructive in the way that we interact with people around us. It blocks the flow of love. And so Satan comes along and he wants you to be offended. Satan comes along and he wants you to be suspicious of someone having a negative imagination about what they're thinking about you or how they're treating you. Satan comes along and wants to plant prejudices, prejudgments in our mind. And then the fourth one that's the common way of attack of the enemy in our minds would be through judgments. That's holding a negative, condemning, disrespectful opinion of someone else. You've formed a judgment about them and you hold to that judgment and you've now categorized a person in a certain way and your categorization of them hinders the way that now you're going to relate to them. It changes your attitudes toward them. So the enemy throughout your life is always working to create division, to create walls, to create cancers and relationships. And he does that in your mind and it spreads through your entire soul. It affects your interactions with others. You cannot think wrongly. You cannot think badly about someone and love them well at the same time. It is impossible to have the wrong thoughts toward someone and the right feelings toward them at the same time. It doesn't work. So if God is love, and we all agree and know that he is, the Bible says God is love, then we would be able to understand his love by the way he thinks about us, right? So let's check it out. Let's do a little test today, and let's see how God thinks about us. If God wants us to have the right thoughts about other people, does God have the right, if you will, good thoughts toward us? Well, let's see what the Scripture says about this. Let's start now in Psalm chapter 139, verses 16 and 17. 
Here's the psalmist describing his relationship with God. Your eyes, talking about God, saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. So when the Bible describes God's thought toward you, how does it describe his thoughts? They are precious toward you. Do you see that God's thinking toward you is a flow of his love in your direction? He has precious thoughts. Take a look with me at this next verse of scripture. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8. After a period of glory, the Lord of heaven's armies sent me against the nations who plundered you. For he said, anyone who harms you, that's the people of God, anyone who harms you harms my most precious possession. So again, how does God think about you? You are precious to God. His thoughts toward you are precious. Take a look now with me at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, New Testament expression of this. But you, God's people, us together, we are, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Think about that for a moment. This is how God thinks about you and how God thinks about me, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful or marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. How does God think about us? If God is love, how does he think about you? Every time God has a thought about you, it's a precious thought toward you. God is for you. He is not against you. God is pulling for you. In fact, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. The Father, the Bible says, daily, consistently making intercession for you, that you will win your battles. God is for you. He is not against you. His thoughts are precious toward you. Think about all the things that you and I have done to cause God to think less of us than he does. All the sins we've committed, all the ways we, re- we have rebelled against him, but nevertheless, God says, my thoughts toward you are precious. He hasn't changed his thoughts about you no matter what you have done. And if you and I are going to choose to love other people, where does it start? It starts where? In your mind, in your thinking. You and I must think the right way about others. It means that we must value every human being. We must ascribe worth to every person. There's not a single person that you will ever meet that does not have value before God. There's someone that God has created, someone that God desires to redeem and bring into the life of the kingdom through his son, Jesus. Every human being has worth. And so to love people is to think in that regard, to value them, to understand the worth of every human being, to understand that every human being has needs. Just like you have needs in your life, even the most difficult person to deal with, if you really look underneath the surface, oftentimes what's happening is they're acting out their needs. They're acting out their own pain. It's been often said that hurt people are the ones that hurt people. And how true that is. And oftentimes we are reacting to the hurt and the hurtful things in other people without looking past that and saying, what are the needs that are represented in that person's life? Is seeing people with their challenges, seeing people with their pain, is seeing that people have gone through life with a certain perspective of their life experiences. They have vulnerabilities and insecurities in their life. And so just as God looks at us and understands these issues in our own lives, that we're worth something to God and that he sees our needs, that he understands our challenges, he understands our pain, that he sees the perspective from which we're dealing with life, he understands our vulnerabilities and insecurities, and he still loves us. This is love. This is agape love. Love is a way of thinking. It is a way of relating to people on the basis of how you and I think about them. There's a second element of love today that we want to look at. Not only is it a way of thinking, but it's also a way of acting. There's an old statement that I want to give you today. You perhaps have heard it before, but it may take a moment just to digest it. I'm going to put it on the board here for you. It's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. Listen to that again. It's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. A lot of times people take this this route in life. I, I will show love to someone as soon as I feel it. 
I don't feel very much love toward them, and so I'm not going to give them any love because I don't feel any love toward them. And so their, their love interactions with other people are based upon their feelings. And so they're waiting around to have their feelings change. Happens a lot in marriages, does it not? Okay. That somehow I don't have the same feeling I used to have for my husband or wife, and so i got to wait until that feeling comes back. Oh, give me the feeling again. If I get the feeling again, then I can sort of begin to act like I love, but i got to have the feeling. Where did the feeling go? And we fail to realize that it's a whole lot easier to act your way into a feeling than it is to feel your way into an action. I would assure you that if you're waiting around to feel some love for someone before you love them, the devil will do everything possible to keep you from ever feeling any love for anyone. So that's why the Bible says that love is not, all, it's not about a, a feeling. It's about a way of thinking and it's about a way of acting. When you begin to act in love toward others, it's interesting that the more you act in love toward them, the more you begin to feel love for them. Your emotions become a part of your actions and your thought process. It's true in every realm of life. It's very true when it comes to love. See, the concept of love being a feeling, I hope you'll hear me today. This is so extremely important for our biblical understanding. The concept of love being a feeling is nowhere found in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with feeling. I certainly believe that God feels love for us. But love is not defined on the basis of a feeling. It's contrary to what the Bible teaches. Love is a way of thinking and love is a way of acting. It's a way of behaving. It's a way of doing things. It's translating your thoughts, your right thinking, into right actions. God showed this to us himself. That he showed that his thoughts were more than just good thoughts toward us, redeeming thoughts toward us. But he translated his thinking into action. Take a look at, with me at Romans chapter 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the very important word here. What is it? Not the godly, but Christ died for the ungodly. Think about that just for a moment. Before we were even lovable at all, before we had anything that would attract God's attention in the sense of being lovely or doing the right thing, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates, another key word, he acts out. He acts out his own love for us. And this, while we were still sinners, what did Christ do? Christ died for us. So two very important words to set the stage of these verses. While we were ungodly and while we were still sinners, while there was absolutely nothing lovable about us. Would you agree that if you're ungodly, you're not very lovable? And if you're a sinner, you're not very lovable to a holy God. But the Bible says that God did not base his love for us on our godliness or on our perfection or sinlessness. God loved us and demonstrated, acted out his love for us while we were ungodly and while we were sinners. He sent his only begotten son into the world to die on the cross for our sins. This is love. It's not about a feeling, it's about an action. Love starts in your thinking, it is expressed in your actions. This means, here's a very important thing as well, this means that you can show love even when you don't feel it. Amen. Let me stop there for a moment, because that's, racking, that's, that's, that's messing up somebody's world right now. Okay. <laughs> you can show love for someone even when you don't feel it. Because love is never defined, first and foremost, as a feeling in the Bible. It is a way of thinking. It's a way of acting. You can even love people who are undesirable to love. Because your love is not based upon them earning your love. It's based upon how you choose to think about them and how you choose to act toward them. You can even love your enemies. Think about that just for a moment. Jesus made this clear. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. That's the way most of us live, right? Okay. You've heard that's the way most people think. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, 
He's turning the apple cart upside down. I'm telling you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Implying that everybody does that. Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Even the most evil among us, Jesus is saying, for the tax collectors of his time were notorious for the way that they robbed and misused and mistreated people. Think about this for a moment. Jesus said, everybody in the world operates according to this dictum. Love your neighbor, hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies. How could Jesus command us to love our enemies if love was based on a feeling. I don't feel very nice toward my enemies. How about you? I don't feel very loving toward people that are, that are working against me or somehow uh, against me in my life, nor do you. And so if love is based upon a feeling, it would be impossible for us to love our enemies. But Jesus raises the level of love to something that goes beyond emotion because he understands the fickle nature of emotion. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to love on the basis of how you think and how you act. Love is a way of thinking. It's a way of acting and behaving. So what does this behavior look like? What does this thought process look like? Well, the Apostle Paul wanted to make sure that all of us fully understood what love was all about. And so he included in his first letter to the church at Corinth an amazing entire chapter on what love is about. We will often see this, uh, this passage I'm about to read for you in wedding ceremonies. We'll see it on greeting cards, but the question becomes, do we really study it for ourselves because the instructions that are given to us are not just nice words that are meant to be poetic. They're meant to be the way that we live. Amen. So I want to read for you a very familiar passage of Scripture. And I'll read it first from the, uh, from the New International Version, then we'll take a look at it from the Passion Translation. But look at what Paul says about love. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse number 1. So here we now begin to see what love really looks like. Are you ready? Are you sure? Man, it's really quiet in here today. Okay, I'm just say. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have agape. If I speak in tongues, all these spiritual gifts, all these abilities to do these amazing spiritual things. But if I do all that stuff, but I don't have love, what am I? I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just a bunch of noise. Just making noise. That's all I'm doing. Okay. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have, the, have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. He says, I might be able to prophesy, tell you what's going to happen in the future. I have that gift of prophecy, that amazing Holy Spirit gift. I might have such amazing faith that I can walk to a mountain and say, hey, mountain, move in the name of Jesus, and the mountain moves. Wouldn't that be very impressive? But Paul says, I could do that. I have this amazing gift of prophecy. I could move mountains with my faith, but if I don't have love, what am I? Nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, that's a pretty admirable thing to do, Right? And give over my body to hardship that I may boast. But do not have love, I gain nothing. And then Paul turns to the clear definition of what agape love is. Remember, it's not a feeling. It's a way of thinking and it's a way of acting. Okay? Not a feeling. It's a way of thinking about people. And it's a way of acting toward people. And here's the definition. Love is patient. Love is kind does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. We could stop right there, right? Okay. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Read these last three words on the board with me. Love never fails. Think about this. Agape, what is never a 
checked it out in the original Greek language, so I would fully understand never means never, okay? <laughs> it never fails, okay? Think about one thing in your life that you could say will never fail. And the Bible has told us the one thing that will never, ever fail you in life. And what is it? It's love. The, not just any love, the agape love. Not storge, not, certainly not eros, not philia, but agape love. Love never fails. Let's read this from the Passion Translation, just the definition of love here, picking up in verse number four. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessings come to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter. For it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat. For it never gives up. Read the last five words on the board with me. Love never stops loving. I like the way it says that. Love never stops loving. Love never fails. Love never stops loving. As I was preparing for this series of messages, I found myself in this chapter and I began to study it in a way perhaps I had not quite studied it in the past. I've certainly been familiar with this passage, preached on it numerous times over the years. But I was really taken in a new way by the instructions of what love is. What does it look like? Certainly convicted in my own life about areas where I need to grow in the love of God. Would you agree with me that you need to grow in the love of God? I certainly do. And you can't grow in something you don't understand. You can't grow in something if you don't understand what it is. You can't set some goals for your life and ask God to help you with something that you're just aiming for in the dark and say, well, I hope I love people more. What does that mean? I don't know. I just want to love people more. Okay. And God says, no, I'll give you some, actually, I'll give you some targets to shoot for. I'll give you some things that you can understand what it looks like, okay? And so when you start praying to love people more, then you realize, okay, I've got to think this way. I need to act this way. There are 15 characteristics of love that are presented here. I'm going to walk you through every one of them. We're not going to be here long, so don't get nervous right now. I mean, we're going to be okay. We'll go through these very, very quickly, but let's look at these 15 things. First of all, love is what? It's patient. It bears with the slowness of people. Do you have any slow people in your life? It's an action. You bear with the slowness of people. Love is patient. Love is kind. Kindness is represented in your words, in your attitudes, in your actions that are gentle and pleasant and relieving of pain in other people's life. A kind person relieves the pain of other people instead of causing pain. There's some people, as soon as they show up in your world, you know what their name is. It's called pain. They're creating pain for you. But you don't want to be that kind of person. You want to be the kind of person that when you show up in a person's life, you come and you're you're bringing to them kindness. It's something that God can give you the ability to do. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Gentleness, kindness. Does not what? Envy. Why is this important? Because envy is all about you comparing yourself with somebody else. It's you looking at what somebody else has or the opportunities they have and comparing yourself with it. So you end up with offenses in you because of what you perceive to be the advantages of someone else or you begin to degrade yourself in some way because you feel like someone has it better than you do. And it's a, it's a very, a comparison results in the envy or jealousy in our lives is very destructive. The Bible says that jealousy is like rottenness in your bones. Think about that. Their people are being eaten up with jealousy. It's like a cancer inside of you. As I've mentioned to you many times before, social media propagates that comparison mindset, looking at what you think somebody else has that you don't have in your life. And before long, you've got envy and jealousy raging inside of you, and it's eating you up from the inside out. Love does not envy. You're not spending time comparing yourself with others. It does not boast, is not proud. I'll link both of those together. That is, it's not self-exalting. A loving person is always trying to exalt me, look at me, and promote me. Let me see if I can get out in front of everybody. And so everybody will know it's all about me. And so real 
love doesn't do that. Real love puts others first. It brings others to the forefront rather than yourself. It does not dishonor others. It means that you treat people with honor in the same way that you want to be treated. Would you agree that you want to be treated honorably in your life? Do you want to be treated respectfully? Of course you do. Well, love makes the choice to treat other people honorably and to treat other people respectfully. Love, what is it all about? It is not self-seeking. What does this mean? It means it's not seeking what they can get out of a relationship. A lot of people enter into a relationship with one thing in mind. What can I get out of this? What's the benefit for me in this? Let me see what I can, I can drain out of this person, what I can get from this other. I want to latch on to them as long as I can get what I want to get from them. And then once I've gotten what I want from them, I will discard them and move on to the next person from which I will seek to get what I want in life. It's called self-seeking. What can I get? It's not easily angered. This has the ability, the capacity, the commitment to manage their own emotions, to manage their own disappointments and frustrations, to manage their own anger, to not let rage control them. It's not the kind of thing about like, like the person who's always carrying a chip on their shoulder waiting for someone to knock the chip off so that the, a fight can ensue. No, they have the ability to make sure they, they're Teflon in the sense of not letting things stick with them and hurting them and carrying around offenses in their life, not easily angered, and then keeps no record of wrongs. We could really stop right there, correct? Keeps no record of wrongs. I think we could probably stop right now and have an altar service and all of us could come down and repent, right? Okay. <laughs> think about this for a moment. Keeps no record of wrongs in your life right now for all of us here most of us here, probably all of us here, somewhere in our soul there's a little book and it has pages in it. At the top of the page, somebody's name is there and listed are the offenses that they've committed against us. We flip the pages, somebody else's name. And some of you have a whole encyclopedia <laughs> inside your soul that I know that sounds funny, but it's true. So many people are carrying. Think about it. If you were carrying a whole set of encyclopedias around inside of you, would it weigh you down? Of course it would. Would it hinder your capacity to love? Of course it would. Because you're viewing people through your offenses, through the record of wrongs. You view them through that. And not only do you view those people, but you actually begin to view other people based upon how other people have treated you. And so suddenly now it's not just them, but... If you're not careful, the whole world becomes an offense to you. Some of you have pulled a few of those pages out and forgiven some people. Some of you still have a number of pages, but you're still keeping a record of wrongs. And the Bible says that we're not to carry that record of wrongs inside of us because it, it, it defeats the love of God in our heart. That we're to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. That doesn't mean that what another person has done to you is right. It just frees you of the poison of it in your own soul. Amen? keeps no record of wrongs. And then it does not rejoice in evil. It's not set up to do evil things to people. You're not trying to manipulate people with evil intentions. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always what? Perseveres. And what does love do? It never, ever fails. Can I submit to you today and encourage you to take this list and let it become what I want it to become in my life in a new and fresh way, a checklist. Because love is not just some ethereal thing out there, and it certainly is not a feeling. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of acting. And God said, I'm not going to leave you without information about how I want you to think and how I want you to act. We have a whole chapter in the Bible called 1 Corinthians 13 that lays out for us clearly what love is. And I will conclude with this. Dear ones, you know this, but I want to say something that we all know today. What our world needs right now is love, the love of God, okay? We all understand the divisiveness that has existed in our culture. 
but may it not exist in us as believers. Okay. May God purge our hearts from everything that is contrary to his love because we're held to a higher standard. And the higher standard is what God's word instructs us to do. And that is to live in the same love that God has demonstrated to us. By the power of God's Holy Spirit, may he help us to live that way in our lives. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, we thank you for your word today. We're grateful for the opportunity that we've had to study. We're grateful that you have convicted us today about things in our own lives that we need to address. Lord, so many times we come up short when it comes to love. Our love grows cold. We withhold love from people. We fail to think about people the right way. We fail to act toward them the way that you would want us to. Lord, we're so very fickle when it comes to love. But Lord, your love for us is constant. It never changes. So I pray that more and more every day that that same kind of love that you show us would not only be experienced by us, but would flow through us to the world around us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Lord, I also pray today for those among us who perhaps have never given their life to Jesus. I pray that today would be that day they would open their heart to you. This will be their moment of receiving you as Lord and Savior of their life. Come, Holy Spirit, and draw people into relationship with you, we pray today in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to ask no one to be moving around, looking about for the next few moments. If you're watching online, let me encourage you to stay right with me through these next few moments as well. If you want love in your life, it has to start with a source, and that source is God. And you and I experience God in our life through his son, Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father except by me. So to have God in your life, you need a relationship with Jesus, a personal relationship with him. How do you have that in your life? You do it by inviting him into your life. Jesus said in Revelation 3, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and have a relationship with him and him with me. So Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. He's saying, will you let me in? My question to you, will you let Jesus into your life today? How do you do that? By praying a very simple prayer. I'll lead you in the prayer right now. You can pray it right where you are. Just whisper these words, mean it from your heart. This can be your moment. Start by whispering the name Jesus. Just, just go ahead and talk to him. Whisper to him, Jesus. Go ahead and do it, Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner. I'm so sorry for everything I've done wrong. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're the Son of God and the Savior of the world. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you're alive. I believe in you, Jesus. Tell him that right now. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for all of my sins. I turn my life over to you today. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for each person that just prayed that prayer. I thank you for hearing them. And Father, I pray that you'll help them now to grow in you, to discover the great plan that you have for their lives and fulfill the purpose for which you created them. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we welcome some people to the family of God today? Fantastic. If you, uh, if you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus in your life, we'd like to give you a copy of this little book called A New You. And there are people literally around the worship center uh, ready to provide that for you. If you pray to invite Jesus in your life, find that person that's closest to you. Walk up and say, hey, I pray with the pastor. Get a copy of this book. It'll get you started in that relationship with him. If you're watching online, the chat host will let you know how you can get that as well. If you need prayer, some fantastic people around the front would love to pray with you about any needs you have in your life. Feel free to come and uh, take advantage of their desire to pray with you, to stand with you in prayer. If you're online, the chat host will let you know about a prayer team there. If this is your first time with us, head right over to my right. There's some fantastic people right over there who'd love to say hi to you. They have a gift for you at our hospitality room. Again, if this is your first time, stop by just for a couple of moments and say hi to them. Why don't we stand to our feet as we get ready to head into a brand new week. Thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget, Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., our midweek 
Thanksgiving Eve service. It's going to be a fantastic time. Make plans to be here. Now may the Lord God Almighty bless you and keep you. May He make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and grant you peace. May you walk in the fullness of His love and may His love be expressed to you and through you. In Jesus' name, amen.